You've heard the terms, you've been through security training, you know how to protect data. But are you always doing it, especially now when working remotely introduces a whole new set of challenges? Today we're talking with Mary McDaniel and Schutz, Director of ESU Health Services, Sheila Markowitz, ESU's Registrar, and Gary Dodson, ESU's Information Security Officer. I'm Dakota Taylor with Tyler Parker, and this is Across Campus. All right, thank you all for joining us. Um, let's jump right into this. Mary, we'll start with you. Can you tell us the type of data that you oversee and why it's important that we are in the compliances that we have to follow? Sure, so student health um, and counseling, so student wellness, um, we have um, protected health information or PHI, um, which falls under HIPAA. So we, um, we would have fallen under FERPA, and we did fall under FERPA with our records carved out under a, a special um, handling until we started doing electronic um, filing of health insurance, and that automatically put us into the HIPAA category instead. And so um, there are all sorts of, um, well, Gary can tell you, we've been doing a an audit that has is now the audit from hell that there see the first where the audit that goes on and on and on and is never ending um we uh there are so many pieces to that um there's the privacy part as well as the security part um just protecting um, people's um information as well as their records as well as the the security piece um, yeah. Very nice. And so Gary, we'll jump over to you because you follow, it sounds like you follow some of the same guidelines that the Student Wellness Center does. Well, the data that, that we protect on campus falls under a lot of different areas. Um, in addition to the health information that Mary is uh, in charge of, we have student information, um, we have credit card information, we have personal you know, identifying information like uh, so, uh, social security numbers and dates of birth, things like that. Um, so we have several different categories uh, that we have to uh, protect. Very nice. Um, Sheila, do you follow, do you follow HIPAA in your department or is it FERPA for you? For, um, for our department, it's FERPA. Um, we don't have health records. Health records are kept separate in, in Mary's area. So our area is uh, focused on FERPA. And of course, PII, the, um, that information is part and is often part of the FERPA uh, information. So student records also contain, like Gary mentioned, social security numbers at times, um, credit card information, uh, and all of the students' personal information. So like grades, enrollment, um, transcripts, uh, all, all of that information is considered part of the student's record. So all of that is protected by FERPA. Okay. So what if I'm not sure um, if I should be sharing like specific types of data? Um, what type of controls do you guys have in place to protect this? And she will, Sheila, we'll go ahead and throw it back to you. So um, as, a, as a student, um, you have the right to share your information with whomever you want to. You just have to notify our office that you approve that. So let's say you want your uh, transcript to be shared with somebody who's gonna offer you a scholarship. So there is a process through the transcript request, you're stating, you're giving us your permission to furnish that information to that third party. So, um, there's also places, uh, checks and balances that we have in place on campus uh, for individuals outside of our organization, as well as inside our organization that may request information. So <clears throat> even if you work at Emporia State, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right to that student's personal information. You have to demonstrate what they call an educational need to know. So um, they, there is a process through uh, in coordination with IT where they would request, do a report request if it's like a list of students that they want to see who might meet a certain criteria. They would go through that report request, which would then 
uh, be funneled over to me to review whether what they're asking for is appropriate or not. Okay. Off campus, uh, that often triggers what's called uh, a CORA request, which is a Kansas Open Records Act. And on those requests, we do involve legal counsel and he and those requests are funneled through him. Okay, okay. Um, Mary, I'm sure you also have, you know, working at the Student Wellness Center, I'm sure you have, you know, several guidelines that you guys have to follow <laughs> and um, many controls that you have in place then. So can you give us some examples of those? Sure. Um, to begin with, those are all spelled out in that piece of paper that everybody signs and nobody reads. <laughs> called a uh, Notice of Privacy Practices. Um, so uh, anybody who's ever gone to any sort of medical appointment anywhere ever um, has the, uh, is given the opportunity to read that. Show of hands, who has ever actually read that entire document besides me once? Yeah, I read it once. Somebody. Yeah. Um, we usually just look at the length of the document and say, eh, okay, <laughs> and sign it, right? Um, right? So, but it is all spelled out there for you. If you wanted to read it all, you could. Um, we are legally obligated to give you the opportunity to read that um, information that spells out how we handle that. So that's called notice of privacy practice. Every um, patient has has to acknowledge that they've been given the opportunity to read that before they can be um, seen in the practice. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, and then secondly, um, every record has to um, be available to the, the student or the patient um, should they decide that they want to um, see it or have it sent somewhere else. Um, and that is done by a written release. Um, and we do, the, we do that a lot because um, students are mobile. They don't stay with us forever. Um, and they'll often want their records sent somewhere else. Um, like Sheila, we do often also get um, requests from external sources. Um, sometimes uh, another provider, which is, is not a big deal, um, but sometimes from some sort of legal entity, either um, a student may be filing, um, let's see, trying to get a disability claim um, or mm, any, maybe sometimes it's a court proceeding. Um, maybe they've been involved in a car accident and an insurance company is trying to gather information, some of those kind of things. Anything like that that um, involves a subpoena, anything like that, again, like Sheila, we involve legal counsel and make sure that everything's, um, all the paperwork is in, is in order. Um, but to release information, um, it does require a, a legal um, release of some sort. Um, and then within our electronic records system, we do a disclosure. So we, um, we are obligated to track how we have released the record, to whom we released it, and the purpose for its release. So every time a record is um, released to someone, that is tracked, and that's called a disclosure. So that's, that's a primary um, way that that is managed. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Gary, we'll go ahead and finish this off with you. Uh, again, what kind of controls then do you have in place um, to protect data? I'm sure you've got plenty. <laughs> Wow, that, that covers a lot of area. Um, I will say that the biggest tool, two tools that we have, one is training to make sure that all the folks on campus know what kind of information we're trying to protect and uh, the degree to which we're supposed to protect it. Um, the number one source of compromise of information deals with um, individuals voluntarily giving up access to their account by being um, scammed or, or, or tricked into it. Um, and the more education that we can offer our faculty and staff, the better able they're able to um, recognize these threats and avoid them. The other tool that we have is policy and procedure. Um, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we have secure methods of doing things uh, publicized um, for the different areas that need them. 
uh, in our business, knowledge is probably the best tool that we have. Very nice. You so kind of, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tyler. You kind, of, you kind of touched on it here. I want to, I'm going to kind of play off of Mary and I want to show a hands who here has completed their security awareness training. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right, June 1st. That June is such first. not nice, Tyler. Calling us out on that, man. I was just thinking, oh, Touché. Touché. a good thing to do while I was uh, <laughs> exactly. from home. While we're all stuck at home, this is the perfect opportunity. <laughs> Dang. I did that remind was... my staff to get it done while they're working from home. Is that <laughs> I, did. I did too, Mary. <laughs> that was well played, Tyler. Well played. Do as I say, <laughs> not as I do. I I, I would like to add just a couple of things, kind of the piggy tail off of Mary. Um, we do have a, a release of information, so students, other than their transcript requests, could give uh, certain individuals permission to. Uh, you know, their grades or what have you. So they have to be specific on the request. They can't just say, you know, my student record. <laughs> they would have to say exactly what that is. Grades, um, transcripts, you know, it has to be specific. So uh, because we do follow the same uh, regulations, similar regulations that Mary does and that we do have to um, report out all of the disclosures that we've, that we have made. So students can do that. They can do a release. Um, students can mark their record confidential. So if they mark their record confidential, none of their information that's been identified as directory information can be shared. So one difference between uh, HIPAA and FERPA is that with FERPA, the university has identified what we call directory information. And that directory information can be shared um, openly, okay? So uh, somebody could call in and say, hey, I wanna find out is, you know, is Tyler Parker a full-time student? That's one of the things that we can, by FERPA, we can release that information. But if you have marked your record confidential, we can't do that. So um, there is a little bit of a difference there, and, and all of the items that are considered directory information are listed out on the website under FERPA, and we do send out an annual notice that goes out to all students in the spring. So every year there's an annual notice that goes out to students regarding FERPA, what that means, what is directory information, and spell some of that out like like Mary said, it's that big long thing <laughs> that goes that gets sent out that everybody reads, I know. So <laughs> yeah. So with speaking on the uh, annual information security awareness training, how else are we as a university um, making our users aware of their responsibility in maintaining the security of our and their data? Um, Gary, if you want to start on that. Well, um, we we use the tools that uh, our our web and digital team make available to uh, publicize. Uh, news and, and information uh, when it becomes relevant. Um, <clears throat> I think um, other than the uh, security awareness training, um, we have you know other trainings available. Uh, we have uh, policies, we have procedures. Um, and of course, we have our, our team available to, to take you know phone calls and help people individually as, as the need arises. Yeah. Uh, Mary, working with multiple different employees in the Student Wellness Center, how are they being kept aware of their responsibility of maintaining the security? Of the staff? Yeah. yeah. The, the data, maintaining the security of the data, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Every, all the staff, all the regular staff, all the interns, all the student staff, anybody, if I have volunteers, practicum, anybody on any sort of uh, official capacity has to undergo HIPAA training, which is riveting, fascinating information, <laughs> um, which it consists of mostly a, a very hmm, not so great um, video information with a, a test and then um, reading and acknowledging uh, the, the HIPAA and security policies that go along with that. 
We then also for staff have an annual HIPAA training that we usually do over the one of the break periods when in a downtime. Um, in addition to that, if I, I have, um, as the privacy officer, I have some um, checks and balances in place. I have logs that I um, peruse. If I, um, if I run across some, uh, a particular issue, then I may do a, a quick training on that particular issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're uh, looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was a great answer. Um, Sheila, with is it for is it different with FERPA? Like, is there different um, qualifications that has to be met? Um, so we do require that everybody, all staff members in our office, have to complete some FERPA training. Um, it's some training that we do in house in our own department. Um, we've been working with IT and Gary to develop a campus wide. Uh, mandatory FERPA training. Um, we're one of the one of the few region institutions uh, that does not have a mandatory FERPA training. Uh, most of the other institutions require that all faculty and staff who have access to student information require um, FERPA training annually, or they don't have access to the student information center uh, system. So uh, we have been uh, Corey and. And I have been talking about that. And most recently, Gary and I have, have communicated on uh, once we get some of our existing policies reviewed and in place, that that's one of the next uh, things we're going to tackle campus wide. So right. everybody great. can look forward to get another <laughs> mandatory training. Amazing. Awesome. Look forward, look forward to the future. <laughs> uh, Sheila and Mary both. Uh, touched on this earlier, um, so I'll kind of target this towards Gary, but there are times when data needs to be shared outside of the university. So can you kind of talk about some of the controls and processes like um, like the new email encryption uh, that will like aid with this? So the email encryption that we've just made available, uh, it actually exists in Microsoft um, in the most recent uh, versions of uh, Office. But uh, basically, its primary mission is to um, just send and receive um, private information. We're working on another system that will help us to receive um, protected information like social security numbers and, and health information, things like that, that, that need to be sent from an outside uh, source into campus. For information going out, um, the only mechanism we really have is, well, there, it's twofold. One, information that goes out on a routine basis. Um, for example, financial aids may have information that they upload to a, a, a government website. That all goes encrypted, and that's that's built into that application. Um, if um, the need arises uh, to send information out, and we have you know the proper authorizations through legal and, and things of that nature, then we would use uh, encrypted email to send those. Okay. Or, or if it's available, um, a portal that, that the third party might have available to upload secure information. So Mary, Sheila, um, we'll start with Mary, but how will this email encryption impact your areas if it does at all? Been using it like crazy. I love it. I've been wanting. I've been wanting this for. I don't even know how long. Um, so one of the ways that it's helpful for us is um, getting documents for from um, new students. So um, I email them, and they return um, a scanned immunization record for any, for example, um, or a scanned copy of their insurance card um, and it, it's just it has it's just working seamlessly it's great um, before they would just even if I didn't ask for them to email it I would ask for them to fax it here's our fax number da, 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 da. And here it would show up in my inbox so I was like <laughs> you know and um, they're like, well, it's just an immunization record. Yes, but you wrote your social security number on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, 
So um, it's just, it's been working great. I really like it. So, uh, the, so the, the encryption has been really, really, really beneficial for us as well because, and, and I like how it works where, uh, like Mary said, if you initiate the email, then anything that comes back to you from that email is encrypted as well. So it's been very, very beneficial as we work with students for things like name changes, which you have to have documentation to do that. So um, we're very excited about that as well. Um, it's, it's just saved students and our staff like uh, just a world of hurt. So it's been nice because I'm like Mary, I get a little nervous when people email uh, information like your social security number or uh, sometimes even grades. I, we have faculty that email students grades and, and that's not appropriate to do that. So by having a, the encryption there, um, it, it saves that, it helps with that. So as Sheila, as you were saying, as students or employees, we have access to grades, payroll information, and et cetera. Could you talk about any services that you have presently, that you have presently, if I wanted to give my parents or spouse access to my data, what would I need sure. to do? Sure. I'm glad you asked that because we do have something that's been in place, I'm not sure how many years now, but it's called proxy access. So um, students can go out and create a proxy access for whomever. It could be their parent, it could be an uncle, or who, I mean, it could be their roommate. And that's up to them to decide uh, because the, the power resides with the student. They get to decide who gets to have access and who doesn't. So the student accesses the proxy and um, in essence, they create another uh, login account for that individual. So if you wanted your parents to be able to view information or if your parents say, I'm not paying your tuition anymore unless I get to see your, your grades, <laughs> yeah. you can go out and create that proxy access and it would uh, create an account for them. They would have their own user ID and their own password and they would log into the information that you have um, given them permission to see. So you can say that you only want them to see uh, your grades, or you want them to see your schedule. There's a whole list of things that you can say, yes, I want them to see, or no, I don't. Uh, and you can, and by that same process, you can go in and terminate that access as well at any time. So again, cool. yeah, yeah, again, that that's exciting because the, uh, the rights and the power reside with the student. So, yeah, very nice. Yeah. Uh, Mary, is there, is it, kind of the same kind of the same ways in the student wellness center with stuff like that um not quite that easily accessible um i strongly discourage students from giving open access to anyone um including parents um because situations change and students forget that they have given open access um, and I, you know how I know this? I know this from experience over the years. Um, and students then are angry because parents have information that they don't want them to have. Um, and so I almost never allow that to happen at say a, like a Hornet connection or something when it's really not consent freely given. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and then, um, and something open-ended, I just am really not entirely comfortable with that. We do, I mean, you know, we, we do have some of those, um, situations where we do that, especially if a student has, um, a chronic medical issue or something that where it would really be beneficial to, for, um, the parent to um, be able to check in um, because what the, I think what the biggest worry is, is that my student's going to be in an emergency situation and nobody's going to let me know. That's the concern. Yeah. But HIPAA allows for um, contact in emergency situations. So yeah. once we explain that, 
And that uh, the other is that if my student got into a situation where they needed to be, you know, sent to the hospital or something like that, that I, I wouldn't be aware of that. Um, those kind of situations, we help the student get in contact with their parent. You know, we, we work around, we work with those kinds of situations. So once we talk through those things, there's usually not a lot of need to do one of those kind of open-ended. Um, and it, it really is kind of a developmental process as well. It's kind of part of that easing away, um, you know, growing up kind of process yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, Gary, is it kind of the same? Is there, what are, what are some of the ways that you guys kind of follow in that, in that sense? <clears throat> so, um, Whoa, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, because we have specialized areas, um, we don't in, in IT deal with that as much because uh, that's more of an area that the individual um, departments that deal with that data work with. Uh, we do provide guidance um, in the form of policy that uh, help inform that. Um, but as far as releasing particular types of information to students uh, or students' parents, we really don't deal with that at all. Yeah. Um, so, Sheila, earlier, when it comes to like um, compliance and data management, you kind of mentioned earlier um, that like we're one of the few universities that doesn't require FERPA training. I apologize for that. That doesn't require FERPA training. Um, so, what are some advancements? Is, are there maybe some other trainings that we didn't used to require that now we do? Um, but since you started at ESU, what are some advancements kind of that you've seen um, in regards to data management? Oh my gosh, there's been so much because I've been here for way too long. But um, um, well, when I when I first started, there there was no kind of um, IT security training. There wasn't anything like that. You signed a piece of paper that said, "Yes, I understand that I'm going to use this computer for you know university business and blah blah blah." And you know, if you wanted your paycheck, you signed a little form and off you went. But but they have. Uh, added all of the um, IT security training, which has been extremely beneficial. Um, we review um, the FERPA policy and what, and we have added different things to directory information, which is um, what mainly the only thing I think we've added was uh, photos. So um, that usually pertains to athletics, you know, the students that have their um, athletic photo used in. Uh, programs and for marketing purposes and stuff. Um, but there really was not hardly any security training when I first started. So uh, anything that we've added since then has been, you know, a godsend and a, a benefit. Um, you know, I think part of what goes along with that is also the Title IX training that we've recently gone through. It touches on some of those aspects as well. So, um, there's been lots of training that in conjunction with IT that departments have been able to put out there and, and um, utilize for students and departments. So we get it. We steal a lot of ideas from our uh, partner universities within KBOR. So, um, you know, I get ideas from them on like our FERPA training. I have a lot of ideas from um, KU, K-State, Wichita State on what all they do. So, um, it's not uncommon that some of the universities share that information. Um, it's just easier sometimes you're all in the same in the same field and kind of in the same boat, so to speak. So it's nice to do that. Uh, Mary, then what about you? Have you seen any major advancements, especially you know in the in the student health center? Well, I may have been here longer than Sheila. I'm not sure. Here I have. <laughs> Because <laughs> we had paper records when I got, <laughs> yeah. we, didn't, we didn't have computers when I started. So, so I, I would say that that's probably, yeah, a pretty big advancement um, to go from uh, paper writing on paper records and having, you know, an entire room dedicated to paper charts um, to having an electronic health record and um, we crossed the 10 year mark and are now 
file lists. <laughs> you have to keep paper records, keep medical records for 10 years. And so we've had now our electronic record for more than 10 years. So we got rid of all the, the last of the charts. So that was, that was kind of an exciting day um, when document resources came for the, for the last of the paper yeah. charts. So, yeah. <laughs> um, that is so, exciting. Yeah, that was the, the, I would say the biggest advancement in the electronic world. And uh, things just keep changing with that. Um, recently, um, the electronic transmission of uh, prescriptions for controlled substances is probably our, our most recent um, upgrade when it comes to security and, and technology. Um, that was kind of a, a big deal. Um, so, I, you know, things are changing all the time and all it takes is, you know, Money and time. And, and Gary, I'm sure you've seen, again, a, a lot, especially, you know, in the InfoSec. Well, InfoSec in general, yeah, things change very rapidly. Um, I will say that uh, unlike my colleagues here, I've only been here about a year and a half. <laughs> so <laughs> as, as far as what I've seen on campus, um, it, it may not be quite as extensive as their experience, but I have seen behind the curtain, you might say, some of the technology that's that's changing uh, over time. Um, I will say that our um, account control, our, our email systems, um, our, our assessment process, we, we assess every single piece of technology that is incorporated on campus. And uh, I, I feel like the process that we have used for that has been refined to the point where we can do it very efficiently, very repeatedly um, and uh, effectively. Um, I will say that the uh, the training uh, that was mentioned, um, I can't take credit for any of that, unfortunately. But uh, um, from from what I've seen uh, within our department and some of the historical information that I have, I will say that uh, it's been very effective at reducing the amount of um, uh, account compromise um, and, and risk that we have on campus. Um, I would say we rank as one of the better campuses for um, the way our users identify and report um, suspicious information. And uh, I, I think that's been very beneficial to the security of our, our information over time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For a final question, I'd like to address the COVID-19 crisis. Um, all of our students are ras wrapping up their semester online. Uh, most ESU employees are having to work from home, but still delivering the same services remotely as we did from the university a few weeks ago. What was the transition like for some of your departments? Mary, we'll start with you because I think yours might be the most impacted one from not being able to be visited, but if you want to go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not easy being, being us. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we still do have some clinic hours. Um, this is the first week we've gone to just one afternoon a week in the clinic. Um, and it, it's been tough. I'm, I'm going to be honest. This was, it's not ideal by any means. Um, of course, there's really nothing about this situation for anybody that's ideal. Yeah. Um, so we're we're doing everything that we can to make sure that students are getting um, what they need um, in less than ideal circumstances. Um, and we're we also know that if we need to, if things are not working this way, and we need to go to another to a second afternoon, we're we're willing and able to do that. Um, so we're just we're just um, adjusting as we go, trying to. Um, minimize the amount of foot traffic, um, but still be able to get the, the, the things done that, that, um, that students need. Absolutely. So what we're doing, we're, the majority of, of visits we're trying to accomplish through telemedicine. There's still some challenges there because my two providers both live out in the country with fairly um, unstable internet <laughs> connections uh, makes it a little challenge to do a, a Zoom um, 
healthcare visit when when the internet is sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Uh, so we're trying. We're mostly uh, managing by telephone um, for those visits, and then things that have to be done in person on Monday. So, I, you know, we're and then counseling, of course, is um, they are doing a, a combination of either telephone visits or Zoom visits for uh, for counseling visits as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know I've heard a lot of people talk about like the counseling and like I know a lot of students are thankful for that. I've heard a great handful have started utilizing it mm -hmm. um, ever since being home. So thank you from the student body. Um, Gary, how is it working with other people in information security? Like, is it hard working remotely for you or is it a little bit easier? I will say that our department is blessed in that most of what we do can be done from home. I would say 90% of our work is essentially the same today as it was last month. Um, there are some times when we like to deal one-on-one -on -one with, with folks that, that are having issues that are maybe have an account compromise that we help clean up, um, things of that nature that we can't really do as effectively now, um, but we, we still find ways to do it. Um, so for information security, our tools are all available, you know, through the internet basically. Yeah. So um, I will say, speaking for IT in general, there are some, some people that have to be on campus because we have a physical infrastructure that has to be maintained. Uh, they're not so fortunate as to be able to work from home, uh, but through social distancing and some precautions, uh, we feel like uh, um, they have they have a pretty safe environment to work. Uh, once in a great while, someone from our department will need to be on campus, but it happens very rarely now. Yeah. Very good. Sheila, is working with your team or students become difficult for you with this crisis? Well, it's... Uh... It's different, and, and yes, it's been a challenge. Um, you know, I'll say uh, a couple of things I didn't touch on on the changes is that, you know, we have been, um, as Gary used the term, we've been very blessed to have a partnership with the National Student Clearinghouse for secure delivery of electronic transcripts. So, um, you know, that's one of those places that Gary was talking about where it's a secure uploads. Uh, site where students can go out and request a transcript. Um, it goes into our student information system, pulls the student information, and sends an electronic transcript out. So those those that kind of um, transaction is secured, and there's no we don't have to intervene on it at, at all. Those just go. But um, you know, like Barry said, not all of our not all of our student records. Are electronic. We have, you know, we retain the records for the old Newman Hospital School of Nursing. We have all of the old um, College of Emporia records, and those are on old hard copy transcripts. So that type of information can't be sent electronically, and, and students and um, individuals still request their transcripts. So um, we do have a staff member that goes into the office at least once a week in order to work those transcripts that have been requested to be mailed out or might be somebody who has a hard copy transcript that we need to work with. So uh, we're very lucky for that. Um, the other tool that has been extremely beneficial for us has been the implementation of the OnBase system, which is the document imaging system. Um, it's, it's been a blessing because um, the security level on that is that we can control who has access to which document. Um, IT has, you know, we have the virtual printer. So if I get a transcript, uh, an electronic transcript from, say, National Student Clearinghouse or from Parchment or one of the other transcript providers, uh, here at home, I can uh, pull that transcript up and using the virtual printer, I can move it directly into OnBase. And there's never been a paper copy that's floating around anywhere. And only those people who have access to that document type can see that document. So um, we've had to be a little creative with some of the things, but definitely uh, the tools that IT has provided for us, the OnBase, the National Student Clearinghouse, and the virtual printer have been 
um, a, a godsend to us. Yeah. Just because I'm curious now from hearing your guys' responses, now that it's we're three to four weeks into this, do you think that you guys would prepare any differently for the continuity of like technology or the business perspective sense in any way? Um, Gary, we'll start with you if you if you'd like. There are probably a couple of things we might have done differently um, in preparing for this uh, eventuality had we known about it, you know, three or four months before. But all in all, I think uh, I think the technology is being developed um, at a pretty rapid rate. I, I think uh, just from hearing from other folks on campus um, that the, the tools that they need are either available or uh, or we're rolling them out. Yeah. Mary? Any preparations you would take for this? Um, you know, it's something, this is something that we actually have prepared for since 9-11. Yeah. <laughs> we, we go to meetings every month with the community that works on emergency preparedness. And this is one of the um, events that we, we plan for, um, not, on, not from a technology basis, um, but it is one of the the eventual the you know the disasters that we um, yeah. we prepare for. I have to say that I'm just incredibly impressed that it actually worked <laughs> because <laughs> I can tell you that in in a lot of meetings, um, you know, there was a lot of skepticism that you know that it could just all go online that quickly and. Um, you know, when it has to, it just does. So kudos to the <laughs> IT team because, um, they, you know, really, you guys did great. And, and um, you know, it was, I'm, I'm impressed that um, we could get the whole world working from home that quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's insane. It's hard to wrap your mind around. It yeah. is. It really is. So great job, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Sheila, is there any different kind of preparations that your team would take if this crisis were to arise again? Well, I think um, knowing what we know now, uh, there's definitely things that we would, uh, steps we'd put in place so that it wasn't a um, last minute decision or, um, you know, so some of the, some of the processes we adjusted um, were things that that decision was made you know, just like we got to decide how are we going to do this? This is what we're going to do. So I think this has been uh, like I, I've shared with Corey. I think this has been a blessing in disguise. And I, I like to be able to um, find the good out of every situation. And for me, the good out of this is that it has forced us to look at some of our processes and look at doing them differently. So if something like this should come up in the future, um, you know, we wouldn't be at a standstill. We would, and, and that transition could be a little smoother. So it's been good. Absolutely. Okay. That's all we have for you guys today. Thank you for your time. Um, this has been incredibly informative, insightful. And we hope that you, whether you're an ESU employee, student, or visitor watching our YouTube channel, Realize the importance of keeping yourself informed and are diligent when keeping you and your data safe and secure in a workplace or online. You can find the latest news and threats, how to join our cybersecurity ambassador program, and even try our new phishing portal online by going to emporia.edu forward slash infosec. I'm Tyler Parker. I'm Dakota Taylor. Thanks for watching Across Campus.